Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. World War I – The first war that saw widespread use of modern weaponry, such as machine guns and biological agents on the battlefield. It also saw the usage of unrestricted submarine warfare when the German Empire attempted to disrupt Allied shipping with submarines. One of these submarines, the SMU-28, was a Type U-27 class of which only four were developed that had a fairly successful career. During the time it operated, though, the U-28 sank 40 ships, damaged two more, and captured another two as prizes. However, one situation in particular stands out, and is remembered not so much by naval historians, but rather cryptozoologists, because of the possible sighting of an unidentified creature. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. On the night of March 21, 1973, the sound of sirens filled the air along New Paug Road, not far from Alton and Wood River, Illinois. By the time the fire engines reached the house once known as the Hartford Castle, it was much too late. What time and vandals had not been able to destroy, flames finally did. A house that was once connected to local tales of death prohibition, booze, and ghosts was gone, leaving only a legend behind. Lakeview, as the Hartford Castle was officially known, was constructed by a French immigrant named Benjamin Bizant in 1897. The castle-like house with the red-capped turrets was incredibly expensive, although the source of Bizant's wealth remains unknown. Most believe that he may have been an insurance executive, a contractor, or an investor of some sort. Whatever his profession, he purchased a large section of land near Hartford and began construction on what was to be a dream house for his English bride. Teams of workers with horses were brought in and a moat was excavated around what would be the home site. The soil that was removed from it formed a rise on which Lakeview was built. When the house was completed, it boasted turrets that loomed high above the surrounding countryside and 14 rooms. The floors were made of imported cypress wood and the ceilings supported by hand-carved columns. Crystal chandeliers were used in the mirror-lined main hall, and music could often be heard drifting out over the fields in the evening. The landscaped gardens were decorated with gazebos and statuary, and Bizant scattered his own concrete creations of animals and cannons about the grounds. A stone bridge was built to reach an island in the middle of one of the small lakes that adjoined the moat, and the lakes were used for boating and swimming. Bizant stocked them with goldfish. Tragically, though, Bizant's wife died in the early 1900s 
and he returned her body to England. After that, he lost interest in the castle and sold it before moving to California. Not long after, the ghost stories that became attached to the place began to be told. According to these tales, the lingering spirit was that of the Frenchman's wife, still haunting the place that she loved most in life. The ghost stories became a part of the house, and they continued to be heard for years after, through various owners and even now long after the house has been destroyed. The castle passed through the hands of several owners after Bizant sold it and was rumored to have been used at one time as a boys' military school and later as a home for unwed mothers. Neither of these uses were ever verified. In the early 1920s, it was turned into a resort and during this period was believed to have been operated for a time as a speakeasy. The house was not far enough off the main roads that it could not be found and yet was secluded enough that the partygoers and gangsters who flocked to the place were not bothered. If the speakeasy stories were true, those days did not last long and the resort was later closed down. Shortly after, the castle was purchased by a couple from Wood River and they lived in the house until 1964. Soon after they moved in, they began to have problems with intruders and trespassers. The castle seemed to be viewed by the public as a community property or a park, and the owners stated that people would often just roam through the 35 acres at all hours of the day and night. Some even broke into the house and wandered from room to room as if on a tour. The grounds were apparently too attractive with the landscaped gardens and statuary for people to stay away, and like the gangsters of times past, teenagers often congregated in secluded spots on the estate for clandestine beer parties or searched out the best places to serve as a lover's lane. Hoping to counteract this invasion of privacy, the family opened the grounds to the public on weekends for several years, but eventually this practice ended and the property was again closed down. In 1964, the owner died and his wife moved back into Wood River. There were attempts to rent the house after that, hoping that someone would just remain on the grounds to protect it from vandalism, but this plan fell through and maintenance on the house and property ended with the owner's death. The estate began crumbling into ruin and the lawn became thick and overgrown. By 1971, the house had fallen into disrepair and was showing signs of damage from thieves and vandals. The cruelest blow came the following year when intruders gutted the residence, ripped mantles from the fireplaces, broke windows, and using a small telephone pole as a battering ram, smashed huge holes in the plaster walls. The senseless and stupid destruction led to the house being officially condemned by county inspectors. The final blow was dealt to the castle on March 21, 1973, when it burned to the ground. An alarm was sounded, but by the time that firefighters arrived on the scene, only a tall chimney and burning embers remained of the once grand mansion. The site of the former castle can still be found in a cluster of thick woods and brambles, just off New Pogue Road on the other side of Hartford. Only those who know of the place would have any clue that the ruins of the estate still remain as broken columns, a few pieces of shattered statuary, and the dim outline of the castle's moat. This is a place that has been truly lost by time, and one that, according to legend, remains haunted by the Frenchman's wife even today. There are those who maintain that her spectral form can still be seen wandering through the remains of the estate and that her voice can still be heard as she weeps for the life and the wonderful home that she lost. Others insist that old-time music can still sometimes be heard as well. They say that it floats through the trees and above the fields on summer nights when the crops are tall and when sound seems to carry for miles. Perhaps in another time and place, 
Lakeview still stands and the party still continues, beckoning to all of us from a distant memory that is now long since forgotten. Old houses and ancient crumbling castles are not the only places where ghosts have been reported. Over the years, there have also been many cases of spirits haunting major department stores and even corner shops. As webmaster of the True Ghost Stories site trueghoststories.co.uk, I personally can relate some quite spooky incidents where apparently ghostly activity has been experienced in a shop. A few years ago, my mom worked in a confectioner's in Birkenhead. With it being a very old shop, it was said to have a resident ghost. My mom soon found out that the stories were true. One day, when she was serving in the shop, two old ladies came in and they walked up to the end of the counter to look at the cakes on display. My mom was at the other end at the till. On top of the counter was a large straw tray which was used to display packets of batches. As the other assistant was taking hot pastries out of the oven, my mom had just finished serving a customer and was putting the money into the till when suddenly, without any visible cause whatsoever, the tray got lifted up off the counter and thrown at her shoulder. The tray then crashed to the floor and all the packets of batches fell onto the floor. The two old ladies that were in the shop looked on in utter shock and disbelief and declared that it wasn't them as they were standing at the other end of the shop. Furthermore, my mom's work colleague said that she too had witnessed what had happened and shook her head in disbelief also. My mom had no explanation for this strange incident, but it was just one of many more incidents she experienced in the shop including serviettes flying around in the air after they had all been neatly put in the window, crisp packets getting dropped on the floor on their own, and different items mysteriously going missing. One of the creepiest incidents in this cake shop happened to the manageress, who told the story to my mom. She used to go to the shop early in the morning to prepare everything for her opening at 9 o'clock. As she was putting the trays of cakes into the racks, ready to put on small trays later, she had a feeling she was being watched. She looked over her shoulder and there, standing in the doorway of the shop, was a tall, handsome young man dressed in a boiler suit, and he just stood there, staring at her silently. Her immediate thought was that it was a customer, so she told him to hang on a minute while she finished putting the cakes into the racks. When she turned back around a few seconds later, the man had vanished. She then went cold as she realized something. How could this man possibly have entered the shop when the door was locked? Thinking that he might have gained access through the back entry, she went out there to check but discovered that the padlocks were all still on the door. Again, she could not explain this incident and therefore decided that it must have been a spirit. The Toys R Us store in Sunnyvale, California has a long history of being haunted by a ghost called Johnny Johnston, said to be a disappointed lover who bled to death after a farm accident, and store workers have reported seeing strange things happening, such as rag dolls and toy trucks leaping off shelves, balls bouncing down the aisles, children's books falling out of racks, and baby swings moving on their own. The shop's staff have tried to find a logical explanation for all these incidents but just can't. The store has been featured on the TV show That's Incredible and other programs. A Hollywood scriptwriter for the movie Toys spent two nights there doing research. Psychic Sylvia Brown held a seance in the store in 1978 and has since been back a few times. An Asda store in Patheli is said to be haunted by the ghost of a long-haired man in a trench coat. The apparition has often been seen by staff in various parts of the store. The Marks & Spencer store in Church Street, Liverpool is said to be haunted by the ghost of a woman 
from the 1930s called Lulu. This often appears on the top floors of the store, and she carries a soda siphon, which she has occasionally squirted at people. The other ghosts said to haunt the store is that of a man called Billy McMullen, a 22-year-old junior porter who suffered a tragic, violent death at the Compton Hotel, the building that once occupied the site, in March 1877 after fooling around in the hotel's lift. Another Liverpool retail site, which has garnered something of a reputation for ghostly activity, is the old Owen Owen Building, which now houses Tesco Metro. Back in the 1970s, an Owen Owen female sales assistant saw a tall, distinguished-looking gentleman dressed in Victorian clothing as she worked in an upstairs room. In another incident, a young man serving in one of the departments saw and felt a hand on his shoulder. As he turned around, he was shocked to see that the hand had no arm or body attached. A customer also witnessed this eerie apparition. When a medium visited the Owen Owen store soon after it closed, she determined that there were at least seven spirits haunting the building, all from different eras. A security guard also had a strange experience whilst working there during a refurbishment prior to occupation by another firm. He soon discovered the place was haunted when he did his rounds. On one occasion, the security officer found a strange pair of scissors lying on the floor, and when he examined them, they looked blackened and quite old. He put them in his rucksack, but the next morning when he reached home the scissors had mysteriously vanished. The guard and some of his workmates used the Ouija board at the haunted building one night, and a word that the men didn't understand came through. Gorsuk. The guards laughed at the word. They didn't know that in the 19th century, a barber named John Gorsuk had his premises on Parker Street. This would probably explain the scissors that had appeared in the building. In Hereford, there have been quite a few retail stores where ghostly activity has been witnessed. For instance, at the Sainsbury's store, a very modern building which, as such, would be the last place you would expect to be haunted, the ghost of an old lady has been seen many times by staff. She does a lot of waving and smiling at people. One morning at 4 a.m., a member of the staff came in to open the store and he saw the old lady as he was unlocking the fire exits. The old lady was standing there waving at him, her appearance so clear that the man waved back, thinking it was a customer, only to suddenly realize that it was 4 a.m. in the morning and no one was in there shopping. When the man approached the lady to ask her to leave the store, she simply disappeared into thin air. A similar story was when the manager once saw the old lady in the periphery of her vision. The manager asked her to go and do something under the misconception that it was just a member of the staff. After this, a member of staff popped her head around the corner and asked the manager who she was speaking to. The manager looked to where she saw the old lady, only to find that she had vanished. The staff who work in Sainsbury's say there is a presence and a feeling of being watched. However, the ghost does seem to be a nice, friendly spirit. Sainsbury's supermarket was built on the old Barton Railway Station. In 1934, a G.V. Bennett was in charge. The station was used for goods as well. The Boots store, situated on Hereford's High Street, has some ghost stories that are very creepy. One evening, when the shop was empty, somebody saw a dark figure in the basement. On another occasion, there were two members of staff in the building, and they witnessed the fire drill being set off by unseen hands. The store was checked immediately, but no one else was present in the building at the time of the incident. If ghostly activity is really behind these incidents, then it is not surprising as the building has been around for many years and has had different uses. In 1879, this building was two different shops. A Thomas Frederick Hawkins was a printer and stationer, 
and a Mrs. Harriet Reeves was a watchmaker. The place was also occupied by Marks and Spencer in 1934. The Primark store, situated on Herford's busy Wide Marsh Street, has crowds of customers shopping there daily. But for a building that is so modern, it really is surprising to find a ghost story and so much history here. The building is known to stand on the site of where the Black Swan Hotel previously was. A graveyard previously occupied the site before the Black Swan was built. The store itself is very large, and the front of the shop is said to be the oldest part. The old co-op store was previously at this part of the building. Above is the stock room and cash office, and it is these two rooms that the ghost of a smartly dressed man has been seen wandering around on numerous occasions. The staff has christened him Freddy, and he has been sighted wearing a blue shirt and trousers. One member of staff who had a first-hand account of the ghost was so upset and traumatized by her encounter that she left her job altogether. It is also believed that this ghostly man travels through the shops next to Primark. The Paperway Shop, which is one shop down, also has a ghostly man who occasionally visits, and he is seen wearing the same clothing. The man could be from the old co-op store as the staff uniform was blue. The dress shop, one door away from Primark on the left, also has a ghost of a man in the basement, so it could be that the same ghost is traveling in between all three of these shops. When the site was the Black Swan Hotel, it had a reputation of being one of the city's best pubs, and coaches left the inn daily, traveling to Liverpool. In 1834, the inn had many landlords over its duration. Thomas Jones was vigiler in 1822, and in 1909 a Thomas Owen was head of the inn. The Black Swan also had air raid shelters provided in the basement. Thornton's Chocolate Shop in Eastgate Street, Chester, is said to be haunted by a ghost called Sarah, who hung herself after being jilted on her wedding day. Sarah wreaks most of the unearthly havoc in the top front room and in the cellar. However, her ghost has also manifested in other parts of the shop. Although she is never seen, she has been heard coming down the stairs, singing a strange song and holding out her hands, as if lifting up a long dress to facilitate her descent. She once pushed an American tourist down the stairs. She also frightened an electrician who came to read the meter in the cellar. During Valentine's Day 1991, Sarah got upset over the display in the shop and scattered the heart-shaped boxes of chocolate all over the floor. However, the ordinary boxes of chocolates were left undisturbed. An exorcism held in 1965 dispelled Sarah's poltergeist-like antics for a while. However, she has apparently returned and still creates ghostly disturbances in the shop right to this day. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marler. It's full of the strange and macabre as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, check out Mind of Marler on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marler. I had the pleasure of talking to my 125-year-old great-granduncle back at Thanksgiving, and as is the usual interest, I asked him if he knew any old town legends from before my generation and even yours was alive. He was alive before Puerto Rico became a commonwealth and before Americanization took route. The scary fact of the matter is, one of the stories he told I actually experienced, which is the legend I will be telling you in a few moments. After telling the legend, I will give my personal experiences related to it. 
Legend tells that when the sun dies down over the horizon, when the cerulean sky turns a black ebony and the late night mist rolls over the hillsides, that one should not wander too far from their home or go outside when you live in the rural wilds. For at late hours, when all are meant to be asleep, ghostly howling can be heard in the hills and woods late at night. Many do not attribute this to normal dogs or wolves because wolves do not exist on the island and dogs do not howl so mournfully or ghostly as these skin-crawling and blood-curdling echoes. If you hear these howls, be they far or near, know that outside could be Los Perros de la Cruces. In English, it translates to Black Hounds of the Crosses, a pack of ghostly demon hounds with glowing yellow and fiery eyes that around their necks drag along heavy, rusted, and broken-off chains. They are said to have been the faithful hounds of a shepherd who had died of the Black Death when it ravaged the island some centuries ago. When they laid him in his grave, the hounds were chained to trees at the edge of the cemeteries and were never allowed off the chain. They constantly pulled and pulled, trying to visit their master, releasing unholy and mournful howls all day and all night, non-stop. It would keep the surrounding countryside up easily and this situation continued until one day when the howling stopped and the townsfolk that went to see what is wrong saw an eerie sight. Their chains were all found snapped, but the dogs found dead on the shepherd's grave. Though they were gone, the howling continued soon after their deaths. Every night, those who drove by the cemetery could see black hounds staring at them from the cemetery gates, and this continued for over a century until, one day, the town was expanding and to make room for the residential areas, the bodies were moved to a new site, marked with simple stones high in the mountains where they would not be disturbed. It is said that in moving the bodies, the hounds lost their master, and every night they prowl the countryside searching for the shepherd's lost grave, howling in pain, loss, and rabid anger for those who wander alone at night. They prowl near churchyards, graveyards, and bridges as well, some saying they attack the evil-hearted who possess too much malice. The only trace they leave are footprints burned into the ground or wherever they touch reeking of incense and something sulfur. A good way to ward them off, supposedly, is to place a stick by the door. This resembles the cane of a shepherd and is likely to make the hounds keep quiet and stay away. But make no mistake, at night, when you hear those howls haunt the town of Yako like banshees wailing their grief into the late night hours, make no mistake that they are near, ever searching for their lost master and prowling in the shadows of the evening seeking whom to devour. I did not know of this story until my great-grand-uncle told me of it, but years before I had experienced the Black Hounds of the Crosses for myself. I had experienced them firsthand, for I live in a remote house deep in my own neck of the woods where trees are so high and dense, moonlight cannot even hope to peer through at night. I was alone at home that deceptively peaceful evening my mother had gone to take my brother to basketball practice, and I refused to go because I did not like sports, and so I just stayed doing my homework. The night was quiet, not a single cricket could be heard, and the wind itself grew deathly still. It was an all-encompassing silence that I would have described as too quiet, the kind of silence that was reserved for a graveyard or a funeral. I felt uneasy, though tried to distract myself from the gut feeling of something being completely off by getting back to my work. My stomach went into knots despite how hard I tried to ignore it and keep working and eventually I finished all of my homework 
and was going to take a bath and go to sleep afterward. But that's when I heard it. A howl. There was just one at first. Unearthly in tone. Then came many, many more. Like no dogs I had ever heard, the echoing pierced my very soul in blood-curdling fashion. I could hear much movement outside and the rattling of rusty and old chains hitting the ground at high speed. Curiosity beckoned to me, and so I steeled myself for but a moment in order to do something I would later regret for much time afterward. I edged my way to open the door, and hesitantly, I peered it open and looked outside, and I saw it, glowing yellow eyes, and heard the sound of rattling chains. A hound lunged violently at my door, which thank goodness was made of solid steel. I woke from my momentary daze brought on by my surprise and shut the door immediately and ran as fast as I could to lock all my doors. Then I grabbed a bat from the storage room at the back of my house and was then on my guard. I shuddered and tried to lay still as possible so as to not be heard when the beasts suddenly started tackling the doors and walls of my house, an action not shared by any dog or canine I have ever seen. The bangs, howls, and rattling was so loud I covered my ears because it caused me such discomfort and just prayed for it to all be over. Slowly, ever so slowly, the tackling stopped, but the rattling and the howling was still present. After a bit, I heard the howling move very far away, but still audible, and I saw light pull up by my house. My mom had arrived, and I ran out and pushed her and my brother inside as fast as I could and explained all the events that occurred earlier that evening. They thought I had a vivid imagination and that I was just really stressed out, but I still locked the doors and called the police in a panic. Only the next couple hours when the police arrived did my mother take to actually believe my story. For around the house, in enormous sizes, they found dog tracks around the perimeter of the house and dents in the doors covered with claw marks and teeth indentations. But they did not smell of mud nor of anything normal. But when you got close to the tracks or the marks on the doors, it was found that they smelled strongly of ash and sage incense. This household spirit has many names, such as Demovic, Demalvoy, Grandfather, Grandfather Well-Wisher, and he is very similar to Brownie, known from Scottish fairy lore. However, in the life of ancient Slavs, Demovic is one of the most important mythological creatures. He protects and guards the sanctity of the home. He is believed to protect the home from all kinds of tragedies and disasters, including diseases, thieves, forces of nature, and evil spirits. Though Demovic never brings harm to people, he is sometimes responsible for the so-called poltergeist. In Russian folklore, particularly in the Polish, Serbian, Bulgarian, Croatian, and Ukrainian lore, the Domovic is a male who is sometimes described as an old gray-haired man who loves fire and lives behind the hearth or a furnace, but other people believe that he has his own corner in the home where he lives and eats. Domovic is invisible to the human eye and present everywhere inside the home at the same time, and yet it is said that cats are able to see him. That is why he most probably does not like cats and chases them around the house. So if you see your cat staring at anything inside the home and there appears to be nothing there, the cat may very well be staring at Demovic. Sometimes the Demovic assists the family members with their daily activities, such as household chores, feeding livestock and lending a hand with field work. He can even be a babysitter for small children, and those children can silently play by themselves for hours without making any trouble. Or if your child says he has an imaginary friend, 
his friend may be a Domovic. But it also happens that Domovic punish the women of the house who break diverse long-lasting traditions. At night, food used to be left out for him in his own corner because it brings luck and prosperity to the household. The spirit does not eat this food but rather consumes the energy off the food that is left for him. An angry or abused Domovic is dangerous and can burn the house. In ancient times, this spirit was often consulted as an oracle, and if a question was asked of it and his invisible touch was gentle and soft, then it meant it was a good omen for a family. But if Domovic's touch was cold, rough, and artless, it foretold misfortune and even death in the family. No one knows where Domovic comes from, and it is also difficult to describe him because he is invisible, but he is always present in the home, fulfilling his duties. There are many crimes in ancient Greek myths, but this story is about not only one crime, but a terrible massacre committed by 49 maidens, which are later terribly punished for their horrible wrongdoing. This very powerful Greek legend says that these maidens were daughters to Danaeus, son of Belus, king of Egypt, and twin brothers of Aegyptus. Driven out of Egypt by his brother, Danaeus fled with his fifty daughters, the Danaides, to Argos, where he became king. Soon thereafter, the fifty sons of Aegyptus also arrived in Argos. The sons of Aegyptus presented themselves to Danaeus' daughters and asked to marry them, and unfortunately Danaeus, having no choice, was forced to consent to their marriage with his daughters. He knew that Aegyptus arrived to take over his new kingdom, so he organized a wedding party and decided to preside at the marriage feast. But he had a plan. At the feast, Danaeus gave each of his daughters a dagger, and all of them had been told what to do. They had to obey their father. After the marriage, in the dead of night, they killed their husbands. Only one of the girls, Hypermnestra, did not commit the crime. She felt pity for her young husband, Lyncaeus, and spared his life. She woke her husband, told him the truth, and helped him to flee. Her father, Danaeus, brought her in front of the Argos court and threw her into prison for her treachery to him. One story says that she and Lyncaeus came together again and lived at last in happiness. They had a son, Abus, the great-grandfather of Perseus, the legendary founder of Mycenae and of the Perseid dynasty of Danans. Another story says that Aphrodite, the goddess of love, helped Hypermnestra, saving her from punishment and her husband Lyncaeus, the only survivor of the fifty sons of Aegyptus, who later killed Danaeus for revenge over his brothers. The forty-nine daughters of Danaeus who killed their husbands were punished for their crime they were compelled to pursue in the lower world as a punishment. At the river's edge, they filled forever jars full with holes so that the water poured away and they must return to fill them again and again. Their torture would never end. In Britain's fairy folklore, there is a frightening spirit, Anku, which means death, who is almost identical to the Grim Reaper, often mentioned in the fairy tales that originate from Cornwall and Wales in Britain and Ireland. This frightening and omnipotent spirit has the appearance of a man dressed in dark robes or a shroud and wearing an old hat. At times, Anku can appear as a dark shadow driving a black cart pulled by four black horses. Anku is portrayed as a tall, exhausted skeletal figure with flowing white hair. His head is able to turn at a 360-degree angle to symbolize its ability to see everything, everywhere. 
Ancient tales vary on the details of Anku's identity. One version of the tale says that Anku is headless, yet another describes this mysterious figure with two skeleton assistants who help Anku to collect the souls of the dead. An Anku appears when the last person in a calendar year dies in a parish. Their job for the next year is to guide the dead souls away from their bodies. Anku, who never misses a day, travels the countryside by using only one particular path, and he usually appears at dusk with a scythe fitted upside down. The tale about Anku is very old. The Celtic Britons, who had a strong sense of the nearness of death, they did not fear it because in their beliefs, death represented the beginning of a better life, a miraculous journey to a place where no fear, sorrow, pain, and loneliness could ever hurt them again. However, some were always afraid of Anku, which means grief and oblivion, and he's forever doomed to fulfill his task of collecting the souls of the dead and cannot ever leave it. The spirit Anku is particularly active and powerful on November Eve, October 31st. Ancient people believed that Anku was a personification of death, and to see him was understood as a clear sign of a person's death. An old Irish proverb says that when Anku comes, he will not go away empty. In Brittany, each parish had its own Anku, King of the Dead, that used to pay a visit when the last man died each calendar year. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. The house I'm currently living in is pretty old, but I wouldn't call it ancient. It's just an old house in a very old neighborhood. I've lived here for 20 years, and I've got a lot of stories about this house. Both my father and I have witnessed things here that the average mind couldn't comprehend, from a man walking through walls to the sound of children singing in the basement. We stopped even bothering trying to work out what was behind all of these happenings. I've had the feeling of being watched in this house since I was six or seven years old. I can't see anything most of the time, but I know something is watching me. I ignore it as much as I can. I tend to wake up in the middle of the night. My room is normally the hottest room in the house, but when I wake up, it's freezing. I couldn't see anything, but I knew something was there. One time, I woke up to my freezing room. The door was wide open. I was alone in the house. To my absolute horror, I saw a small figure watching me from in front of the window. It was like a very see-through shadow. I could just make out that it was a child. At first, I thought it must have been my little cousin, but how would she have gotten into the house? The figure stood there until it faded away. I started to see that little figure more often after that. We would often stare at each other, and frankly, it freaked me out. I started to notice that the more I interacted with it, the more difficulty I had looking away from it. I would literally be forced to stare at it. 
The last time I saw it, we were locked, staring at each other, and I literally forced myself to stop looking. The thing didn't like that at all. It screeched, faded, and I never saw it again. I don't even know what it wanted. It was just so creepy. A few months ago, I was awoken by something calling out. The voice sounded like mine, but I can't be sure. I also feel like I'm being followed all the time. I haven't seen that thing, but I know it's around. I honestly don't know if it's a demon, a ghost, or just a figment of my imagination. I used to live with another family, sharing the house of my grandparents where I have experienced numerous unworldly encounters. The other family slept in a large room in the house, adjacent to our bedroom. One morning, the mother of that family told us that one of her three sons sleeping in the largest bed in the room had been grabbed by the legs and pulled down halfway off the bed the night before. Unfortunately, he did not see the doer. By the time he was startled by the pulling and woke up, he already found his legs on the floor. Such a prank was done more than once to more than one of the sons. Having no sorcerer to exercise that spirit, her sons had to continue biting the bullet. As time went by, these incidents eventually became oblivious, and my family never heard about them anymore. Many years ago, I had a boyfriend in Vienna and would sometimes stay with him in his apartment. It was an old building, and the apartment next door had been occupied by a very old lady who had just passed away. This one evening, I was staying there alone. I went to bed and switched out the lights. It was very dark, as it was a gloomy apartment anyway with very thick curtains. I soon got to sleep but was awakened in the middle of the night by a bright light. To my utter amazement, the light seemed to emanate from a picture of the Virgin Mary on the wall between the bedroom and the old lady's apartment next door. I stared and watched this for some time before becoming uncomfortable by it and left to sleep next door. Unfortunately, I could not sleep at all, and once or twice I peeked back into the bedroom which was lit up by the light coming from the picture. As I watched, it seemed to me as if the figure was actually leaving the painting. I was very frightened by this experience. When I told my boyfriend of this, he told me that quite often he heard voices from the empty apartment next door. Our house was built by a man called Jack. Nothing in this house was done properly, and Jack died before he could do any more work. The floors were uneven. The cabinets, walls, and doors were all crooked. It's not a nice house to look at, but that didn't bother me. I had just gotten divorced, and Jack's daughter had invited me to live in her father's old house. I was happy to oblige. The first night I spent there was uneasy. The closet in my room gave me a really strong vibe. But you always think that about a new house, don't you? There's spooks in every new thing we do. Whenever I was in the kitchen, I felt like I was being watched. I constantly felt terrified in the basement. I hated the closet in my room. It smelled so strange. The crawl space under the house gave me my first experience of seeing the paranormal. I saw the figure of a man crouching under there. He looked young and preoccupied. I thought it was the exterminator, but as I walked towards him, he disappeared. Two weeks after that experience, my son told me that the man in the kitchen had threatened him, 
He pointed to the corner and said that he was Jack and that it was his house. He wanted to know what we were doing there and wanted to know where his stuff was. I scolded my son and told him not to make up stories. Naturally, I assumed he had overheard Jack's daughter and myself talking about the house. Later, I would come to realize that Jack was one of the many spirits that filled that house. I saw the man crouching under the crawl space again. He was in exactly the same position he had been in before. I saw a man in the basement who seemed to be crying. One night, I was lying awake and all of a sudden, the sound of old country music on the radio came blaring from the basement. I went down and tried to find out what was going on. When I opened the basement door, the music stopped. But the TV in my room started up and I could hear a boxing match going on. I went back upstairs and my TV was turned off. I sat on my bed and my closet door opened. That was it. I was getting pretty freaked out and I decided to leave. I couldn't take it anymore. I collected my son from school the next day and we went to my parents to stay. My last night in that house was filled with footsteps, music, bangs, and all manner of intrusions. On the way to my parents' house, I was told by my son that Jack and Roy were the two ghosts. They had both died there and apparently didn't know anything about the other. My son explained that they had both appeared to him and seemed to be friendly. Friendly or not, we didn't live there again. I pretty much grew up in my grandma's home. It's small on an Indian reservation, but I loved it. I still do. My mom and I moved back in with my grandma before she passed away. She needed help driving around and keeping up the house. She had a rare tumor that caused her a lot of pain and loss of appetite. She had a nurse who would come and recommended that she go into the nursing home to help her get on a schedule. The idea was regular meals and medicine times so that she could get some strength and maybe the tumor would cause less problems. Unfortunately, it was all anyone could do. They had already operated and removed what they could. If they took more, she wouldn't survive. Well, anyway, my family lives pretty close to one another and my aunt's husband started to tell of a peeping Tom in the neighborhood. A lot of people were scared. I wasn't exactly afraid, but I was cautious. I started to lock doors and windows and double-check them before bed. I was always a night owl, so I was always the last person to check everything before bed. I would turn out the lights and make one last quiet round and then off to bed. The way the bed was facing, I could see out the door and look right at the little Christmas tree and big front window. Every night, I would see someone standing next to the tree. Sure, I was scared, but as I would get up and switch on a light, only the tree stood in the window. I would go around one more time and then to bed, look, and sure enough, he was back. I say he because he had the shape of a man, very square and tall. I never said anything to anyone because I tried to brush it off as I was tired or my mind was playing tricks on me, etc., and I would turn my back, squeeze my eyes shut, and try to sleep. But after a few nights, it kept happening. Sometimes it felt like he was only looking out the window, and other times it felt like he was staring back at me. Then one day, I was visiting my grandma and she was telling us how she kept dreaming of her late husband. She was afraid of him and didn't want him to touch her. He wasn't trying to hurt her and she knew that, but she was afraid anyway. Still, I didn't think much of this at the time. Finally, I said something to my mom and by now it had gone almost two weeks. She said she never heard or saw anyone but me in the house. But she did tell me 
that before my grandma's house was built, another stood in its place. My great uncle Sonny was a smoker and an alcoholic. He lived in the house and it also had a big window. I never knew him because he passed before I was born, but they say he would just stand in the window looking out over the fields and woods across the road. At the time, it wasn't strange because there was a lot of nature around. One day, he fell asleep, and his cigarette caught fire to the place and that is how he passed. I don't know how long it was before my grandma and grandpa built their house, though. Afterwards, when my family moved in, my grandpa would love to look out the big front window. He liked to look out into the night sky or just at the woods like my great-uncle Sonny. I didn't know my grandpa either because my grandpa passed long before my birth as well, but after hearing about Sonny and grandpa, I had a feeling it had to be one of them. I always leaned more towards my grandpa, though, because of the dreams my grandma was having of him. On the morning of December 28th, we got a phone call from the nursing home that my grandma had passed away. It was a really cloudy, sad day. I couldn't believe she had gone. After that, I looked for the man in the window, but he never came back. I never saw him again after that, and that is what makes me believe it was my grandpa waiting for my grandma. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. On July 31, 1915, the SS Iberian, a British merchant steamer, was headed from Manchester to Boston, Massachusetts when it was torpedoed and sank by the U-28 roughly nine miles southwest of Fastnet, Ireland, and resulting in the deaths of seven people. The Iberian sank stern first, with the bow aiming directly upwards, and after about 25 seconds underwater, there was another very large explosion which was most likely the Iberian's boilers exploding. However, during the explosion, U-28's commander, or Captain Lieutenant Frere George Gunther von Forstner, reported seeing something very unusual. In his words, Forstner stated, The wreckage remained beneath the water for approximately 25 seconds, at a depth that remains clearly impossible to assess, when suddenly there was a violent explosion which shot pieces of debris, among them a gigantic aquatic animal out of the water to a height of approximately 80 feet. At that moment, I had with me in the conning tower six of my officers of the watch, including the chief engineer, the navigator, and the helmsman. Simultaneously, we all drew one another's attention to this wonder of the seas, which was writhing and struggling among the debris. We were unable to identify the creature, but all of us agreed that it resembled an aquatic crocodile, which was about 60 feet long with four limbs resembling large webbed feet, a long pointed tail, and a head which also tapered to a point. Unfortunately, we were not able to take a photograph, for the animal sank out of sight after 10 or 15 seconds. Apparently, the crew of the U-28 saw an unidentified sea creature resembling a crocodile get blasted out of the water, land, and then submerge again after a period of roughly 15 seconds. To date, the sighting reported by the U-28 is considered one of the most legitimate and least likely to be a hoax due to the personnel involved and the clarity of the description provided by von Forstner. However, there are also many who take issue with the sighting. One issue that skeptics of von Forstner's account have 
is how only seven people were killed when the Iberian sank, meaning that there were about 61 survivors who would go on to discuss the incident with English and Irish newspapers, as well as a few American passengers who would speak about it with newspapers in the U.S. None of their stories would include seeing a 60-foot-long crocodile-like sea creature. Another issue is how von Forstner is the only member of the crew that saw the creature to have written any accounts of it, as well as not even recording the creature in his log when describing the sinking of the Iberian. There are many reasons, though, as to why von Forstner's account is taken seriously. One reason would be as to why von Forstner was the only member of the crew of the U-28 to report seeing the sea creature. By the end of the war, the five other witnesses whom Forstner had reported were dead, which is not surprising since during both World War I and II, U-boat crews suffered from very high mortality rates. A second reason would be how von Forstner was an accomplished submarine commander with 24 of the ships sank, one ship damaged, and two ships captured when he was the commander of U-28 from August 1, 1914 to June 14, 1916. That could be as to why von Forstner did not report the creature in his log, as he may have considered such a detail to be unimportant during the war. There is also how von Forstner and the five witnesses with him were all experienced seamen, and there's no reason why they should not have been able to identify the creature. Today, the U-28 creature, as it is now called, is ironically enough compared to other sightings of sea serpents despite being described like a crocodile, and some theorize that the creature was actually a dinosaur such as a plesiosaurus or a mosasaurus. There was no concrete way to determine what the facts are, as the witnesses have all since died and there were no photographs taken of the creature. It's important to note, however, that other similar cryptids, such as the Loch Ness Monster and Champ, are also considered to be prehistoric creatures, and that it's very possible that there are many undiscovered creatures roaming the deep, as even the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration states that less than 5% of the Earth's oceans have been explored. The Dunbar family spent a pleasant day fishing at Swayze Lake in Louisiana. It was August 23, 1912. Mrs. Dunbar had prepared a lunch for the family, so the parents and two boys walked back to enjoy a picnic. But their four-year-old boy, Robert, Bobby, never made it. After noticing that he was not with them, the parents weren't that worried. He had evidently just wandered off, perhaps distracted by something in the woods, and he'd gone to investigate. They called out for him, but he didn't appear. As the afternoon dragged on and Bobby still did not appear, his parents contacted the authorities who organized a search of the area. The only thing found was a series of small footprints, which may have been Robert's, leading away from the lake. Despite this clue, the trail went cold. Little Bobby Dunbar had vanished. The search spread out throughout the South, but Bobby Dunbar remained missing. Several months later, in Mississippi, a vagrant named William Walters was discovered with a small boy that closely resembled Robert. Walters claimed that the boy was Bruce Anderson. He claimed that Bruce's mother was his traveling companion, Julia Anderson. Julia insisted that the boy was indeed her son, Bruce. Initially, evidence seemed to bear this out. Bruce did not respond to the name Bobby Dunbar and did not appear to know Mrs. Dunbar when she arrived to see the boy. But Mrs. Dunbar positively identified him as her son Robert. Eventually, the courts got involved. A court-appointed arbiter gave custody of Bruce slash Bobby to the Dunbars, despite Julia's continued declarations that the child was hers. William Walters even went on trial for the kidnapping of Bobby Dunbar and was convicted, although the sentence was later overturned. And that's where matters sat for many years. The boy would be raised as Bobby Dunbar, Walters would insist he was innocent of any wrongdoing, and Julia would tell her other children that they had a brother who had been taken away from them. 
It wasn't until Bobby was grown that he spoke to the media about his exceptional childhood. He would state at long last that he recalled his kidnapping by Walters and his time away from his family. He married and had children, and after his death was buried under a tombstone bearing the name Robert Clarence Dunbar. But he didn't rest in peace for long. Behind the scenes, one of Bobby's granddaughters continued to play the game of who's who. It was decided to settle the matter once and for all by DNA testing. In 2004, the results came back. Bobby Dunbar was clearly not Bobby Dunbar. For most of his life, Bobby had unknowingly lived a lie. But not being Bobby Dunbar did not automatically mean he was Bruce Anderson. Who was Bobby Dunbar? Was he Bruce Anderson? If so, what happened to the real Bobby Dunbar back in 1912? Law enforcement is no longer pursuing the case, but the mystery continues. When I was about 10 years old, I was convinced that there was the ghost of a little girl in my room. I would talk to her every night, and even though she wouldn't respond, I always knew she was there. One night, I decided I wanted her to respond to me, so I looked all over my room for a piece of paper, but I couldn't find one. Instead, I pulled out an old, tiny, dusty chalkboard from my closet and set it on my bed next to a piece of chalk. I wasn't quite sure what to ask, so I just said, um, so how many years have you been dead? Write your answer on the chalkboard if you're really here. Not thinking it would work, I fell asleep. The next morning, I got up and looked at the chalkboard. There was no writing on it, so I picked it up to put it back in my closet. When I was walking there, the chalkboard hit the light. You could clearly see, written in the dust, the number 111. I don't try to communicate with her anymore. Over the course of May 1st and 2nd, 1865, one of the grandest funerals in the entire country was held in Chicago when the funeral train of President Lincoln arrived in the city and thousands turned out to see the body of the slain president. It was in Chicago, where ghost remnants of the Lincoln train are still believed to manifest on the anniversary of its arrival in the city. Lincoln's train had traveled more than 1,500 miles before arriving in Chicago. Hundreds of thousands of Americans had lined the tracks, formed huge crowds, and stood in long lines to view his body. The city of Chicago spent more than $15,000 to create a spectacular arch, design a hearse, and build decorations for the funeral. When the casket was taken off the train, 36 young women walked beside it and they showered flower petals in all directions. The streets were packed with over 100,000 people as excursion trains had been coming into the city for more than 24 hours, carrying curiosity seekers from the east. Thousands lined up at the courthouse in the rain and mud to see Lincoln. Exhausted soldiers and police officers recalled that the lines moved less than a foot per hour on Monday and Tuesday. More trains arrived, bringing more people to add to the chaos, as at least 125,000 lined up to view the casket. Ambulances came and went, carrying injured onlookers and women who fainted from grief and exhaustion. At one point, a section of wooden sidewalk gave way and plunged hundreds into the mud and water below. The route of the funeral procession ran through what was the most elegant section of town. It passed down Michigan Avenue first, then along Lake Street, then along Clark to Courthouse Square, avoiding the world's largest stockyards, the McCormick Reaper Works, and the flour mills. The procession included a legion of clergy with white crosses adorning their black armbands and a division of zouaves in baggy red pants. There was also a group of captured Confederate soldiers 
who had taken the oath and now belonged to the Union Army. They were followed by a troop of more than 10,000 schoolchildren, walking with saddened faces and wearing black ribbons in their hair, along with sashes, armbands, and badges. In the procession were also immigrants from Germany, France, Ireland, and Eastern Europe. They were butchers, bricklayers, tailors, and carpenters, all carrying banners with clumsily worded but unmistakably heartfelt messages about the president. The parade was followed up with a humble yet unwanted procession of colored citizens. When the hearse finally arrived at the city's courthouse, the great bell in the tower began to ring so loudly that it could be heard in the farthest reaches of Chicago. It was not until early evening that the doors were opened to the public, and the viewing went on all night long and all through the following day. It was believed that more than 7,000 people per hour passed by the coffin for a quick viewing of the president. On the evening of May 2nd, the great procession formed again, and by the light of 10,000 torches, the eight black horses drew the hearse with Lincoln's coffin on it back to the railroad depot. The train finally began the last leg of its journey on that night, leaving Chicago and passing under arches which were illuminated with bonfires and decorated with sentiments like coming home, bear him home tenderly, and home is the martyr. The train steamed out of Chicago and in to legend. Over the years, the stories associated with the great funeral train have included a number of ghostly tales from parts of the country that it passed through in 1865. The first sightings of a phantom reaction of the gloomy train were in New York, but they soon spread westward into Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. One of the earliest reports of the ghost train appeared in New York's Albany Evening Times. An article appeared that stated, Regularly in the month of April, about midnight, the air on the tracks becomes very keen and cutting. On either side of the tracks, it is warm and still. Every watchman, when he feels the air, slips off the track and sits down to watch. Soon, the pilot engine of Lincoln's funeral train passes with long black streamers and with a band of black instruments playing dirges, grinning skeletons all about. It passes noiselessly. It is moonlight, clouds come over the moon as the phantom train goes by. After the pilot engine passes, the funeral train itself with flags and streamers rushes past. The track seems covered with black carpet, and the coffin is seen in the center of the car, while all about it in the air and on the train behind are vast numbers of blue-coated men, some with coffins on their backs, others leaning upon them. If a real train were passing, its noise would be hushed as if the phantom train rode over it. Clocks and watches would always stop as the phantom train goes by and when looked at are five to eight minutes behind. Everywhere on the road about April 27th, watches and clocks are found to be behind. More sightings of the phantom funeral train began to enter the regional lore of the places where the train had once passed. Many of the stories are still told, even in areas where the railroads have since faded into oblivion, disrepair, and abandonment. The stories still speak of a phantom train, draped in black, that steams along tracks that are no longer in operation, or have been taken over by companies that did not exist back in 1865. One such place is Chicago, where one of the most impressive funerals was held for President Lincoln. Many still believe the train makes an appearance each year at the beginning of May, the anniversary of the train's arrival and departure to and from the Windy City. The old tracks, part of the Illinois Central Line in the 1860s, is now used by Metra, which brings commuters back and forth to the city from Indiana, skirting along Lake Michigan. In early May, it is not uncommon to find history buffs, Civil War enthusiasts, and ghost hunters camped out around the tracks. The historians are remembering the history that once passed by this place, but the ghost enthusiasts are hoping that history will repeat itself in spectral form. Occasionally, they do not go away disappointed, and according to tradition, if the train does pass by, clocks and watches along its route 
will cease to work, perhaps never keeping correct time again. Urban legends are thought by most to be tall tales passed down through the ages. Some of the stories are obviously make-believe, while others, as strange as they may seem, have their origins in actual events. Do alligators roam the dark tunnels deep beneath New York City? Do boogeymen who terrorize those afraid of the night really exist? Are killer clowns a myth born from our fear of the unknown, or could such evil truly walk among us? These are just a few of the urban legends that are explored in this book. After hearing some of the history for yourself, maybe you will be able to answer the age-old question, could it be true? Could It Be True, Volume 1, Urban Legends by Cindy Parmiter, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. This story takes place in Brigham City, Utah during the winter of 2003. My wife and I and our two cats had moved to a new rental house across town a few months prior. Almost directly across the street from our house was a mortuary. In fact, you could see it through the living room window. At first, my wife wasn't sure if she was okay with the idea of living across the street from a mortuary. However, after some reassurance from me and a lack of other housing options, she settled in with the situation. Just a little background, my wife does not like being scared at all. She hates scary horror movies, especially if they have a paranormal or supernatural premise. She does okay with zombie flicks and the like, but ghosts and the paranormal aren't her cup of tea. I, on the other hand, love horror movies. I love the adrenaline rush with being scared and coming down from it. Over the course of those few months after moving in leading up to the incident, we both noticed and experienced strange things happening in the house. It was never really serious or felt threatening in any way, just little things that would mess with your mind a bit. For instance, car keys would turn up missing and we would find them in strange places. Chairs would be moved and pulled out from the table. Generally, I'd find out in the middle of the night, stubbing my toe on the way to the bathroom. Our cats would act a little strange sometimes and move and act almost as if they were being pet by an invisible someone or something. Another time, we had just returned from the local Smiths with some groceries. We were both putting groceries away and setting a few out to prepare dinner that evening. I had just put away a can of Pam cooking spray in the lowest shelf in the pantry. My wife reminded me that she needed the cooking spray to help prepare dinner and asked if I could retrieve it from the pantry. I looked inside of the pantry for the cooking spray, and it had vanished. I looked and looked and was practically dumbfounded when I couldn't find it as I had just put it away. My wife couldn't understand it either, as she had just witnessed me putting it away as well. She came over to look for it as well. Together we pulled out all of the items from the pantry, and yet we couldn't find the elusive cooking spray. We put the items back in the pantry, as we both tried to reason with it and came to the conclusion that maybe we left a bag in the car and it's in there, or maybe we left a bag at the store altogether. Regardless, we needed that cooking spray. We searched the car. No dice. I went back to the store and asked the lady at the checkout if we had left a bag. Nada. So then, I further concluded that we didn't buy cooking spray after all and just thought we did. So I bought a can of Pam and headed home. When I got home, I immediately began assisting my wife with dinner preparations and handed her the cooking spray. We finished preparing dinner, put it in the oven to cook, and sat down on the couch and watched some TV while we waited. After dinner, we again sat on the couch and discussed the day's happenings and the crazy thing with the cooking spray. Finally, we decided we needed to get dinner cleaned up and stuff put away. 
We cleared the dirty dishes from the table to the sink and began putting food prep items back into the pantry. My wife hands me the pan to put into the pantry. I open the door to the pantry and out on the floor falls, you guessed it, the missing can of Pam. It was then that we decided that there was more to these strange happenings than meets the eye. Maybe we had ghosts living with us in our house. To this day, we can't explain it. We talked about the possibility of spirits or ghosts maybe wandering over from the mortuary due to our close proximity. We would have more of the same strange things items missing or moved, and they would happen occasionally over the next few weeks. When something of the sort would happen, we would chalk it up to the trickster ghost or ghosts. We would talk to them cool and casually, stating how funny they were for doing these things, maintaining a calm atmosphere. Again, we never felt threatened or scared, and we just went about our lives coexisting with these trickster ghosts. A couple months went by, and we were now in the thick of a fairly heavy winter. One early morning, I was awakened by something. I really can't say what it was, but I just felt off. I looked at the clock, and it was 2.47 a.m. I was a little upset because I had to get up in a little over an hour to get ready for work. My wife stirred a little as I got up and went to the kitchen to drink some water, but she stayed asleep. As I was getting my drink, I started hearing some strange creaks and noises. It seemed to be moving around outside of the house. I listened intently for a few minutes, and then the noises seemed to stop. I wondered if it was maybe punk kids messing around. I looked out the window and noticed it was snowing and had been most of the night, as we had probably close to five inches of snow on the ground. I decided to go back to bed for a few more minutes before needing to get up for work. I pulled the covers over me and settled in again. After a few minutes, I began to hear the noises again and began to feel almost nauseous. I got a weird, prickly, warm feeling at the back of my neck and my hair stood on end. At that time, our cats, both of which slept in our bed, came out from the covers and both puffed out their fur and started growling and hissing as they stared at the wall. I looked and couldn't see anything. They both remained focused, staring, growling and hissing at the wall, essentially ready for a fight. The racket from the cats startled and woke my wife. She sat up and she asked me what's wrong, what's going on? I told her, I'm not sure, the cats just freaked out and started growling and hissing at the wall. Then we heard the doorknob on the front door begin to shake violently as if someone was trying to break in. We both jumped out of bed and ran to the front door. We both witnessed the doorknob shaking. I told her I had heard some noises earlier moving around outside the house and told her how I thought it was just some punk kids messing around. My wife decided to run to the phone and call 911. I told her, stop, don't call 911, it's not a burglar, it's probably just some punk kids. Then I finally had enough and yelled, you damn kids, I'm coming out to beat your ass. Just then, the doorknob stopped shaking. I just knew I'd scared them off and they were scattering to run away, so I decided to really put the fear of God into them and chase them down the street. This'll teach those damn punk kids, I thought. My wife tried to convince me that running into the night during a snowstorm wasn't a good idea and to just let them go, but I was pretty upset and I knew better. I opened the door to run outside, and as I did, snow fell all over my bare feet and onto the floor. The fresh, undisturbed powder had drifted up my door and toppled over when the door stopped supporting it as I opened. I stared out and looked in bewilderment at nothing, absolutely nothing, no kids, no tracks in the snow, nothing, nothing but five plus inches of fresh powder covering the porch, stairs, lawn, everything. There was no way for anybody to reach the doorknob without disturbing the snow. It was at this point that I became somewhat scared, mostly just unsettled as to what had just happened. 
Shortly after, the cats calmed down and went back to sleep. My wife and I, however, did not go back to sleep that night. In fact, she had me take a sick day from work. We turned on all the lights in the house, listened to Disney music, and played board games until the late morning. This incident was different than the previous ones. The uneasy feeling, nausea, and hair standing on end. This wasn't our normal trickster ghost that we had been accustomed to. This was something more. It seemed aggressive and angry. We never had any more incidents like this one in the house. We stayed in the house a while longer, but moved out a few months later due to unrelated circumstances. One morning, a couple of weeks back, I woke up and grabbed my phone. About an hour later, I started hearing footsteps coming towards the door. I went and checked, but nothing was there. I got back in bed, and then the scariest thing in my life happened. I heard a little girl say, help me. In shock, I sat there, and again I heard a voice, but instead of a little girl, I heard a middle-aged woman shout, help me. I couldn't move, and then heard a really old woman scream, help me. I got up and ran out of my bedroom. Thankfully, nothing like that has ever happened again. There are many intriguing time travel stories. One of the most puzzling accounts deals with Samuel Warner, a very brilliant but eccentric British inventor who some thinks designed a real time machine based on secret ancient Egyptian knowledge. The time machine is allegedly sealed in a granite mausoleum in Brompton Cemetery in West London. It's said that if the tomb is opened, it would reveal one of the greatest discoveries of all time, a fully functional time machine. So why don't we open the tomb and take a look what's really inside? One of the reasons why it hasn't been done is because there are no keys to the time travel tomb. The story goes back to Victorian times and contains all intriguing elements that would together make a good sci-fi movie, but what if almost everything turns out to be true? Born in 1794, Samuel Alfred Warner was son of a sea captain, and as a child he developed a strong interest in various kinds of inventions. As a young man, Warner contacted British naval historian John Knox Lofton and asked him if he could purchase the design for a certain device. Apparently, Warner started to experiment with the design and, in time, created a powerful device known as an invisible torpedo that could sink any ship into pieces. Warner refused to show the actual device to anyone in the Navy. He also refused to release design schematics unless the Navy first forked out 200,000 pounds, which would be the equivalent of about 7 million pounds today. Whether his powerful weapon was taken seriously or not by the British Navy is still unclear. According to some sources, his invisible torpedo was investigated by Duke of Wellington in cooperation with the Navy's Ordnance Department, but everything came to an end when Warner died. Samuel Warner was close friends with Joseph Bonomi, the Younger, one of London's most respected architects and Egyptologists. Joseph Bonomi, the Younger, was son of Bonomi the Elder, who was an important architect fascinated with history of ancient Egypt. In the village of Blickling near Norfolk, Bonomi the Elder constructed a mausoleum in the shape of an Egyptian pyramid. There are many reports of strange phenomenon around the curious structure, which is often the reason why it's investigated by paranormal investigators. Joseph Bonomi the Younger learned a lot about Egypt from his father, and he became later curator at the British Museum and was widely recognized as one of the greatest Egyptologists in Great Britain. Joseph Bonomi the Younger was one of the first people who saw mysterious papyri scrolls containing voluminous hieroglyphic texts found in the Valley of the Kings. 
there are those who believe Joseph Bonomi the Younger learned incredible information from these papyri scrolls that were kept a deeply guarded secret, including possibly the key to a method for teleportation and time travel. At this point, the entire story becomes even more exciting. Samuel Warner and Joseph Bonomi the Younger were very good friends, although the two men came from different social classes. Warner was a commoner and died as a poor man while Joseph Bonomi the Younger was married to Jesse Martin, the daughter of one of England's greatest and most wealthy painters, John Martin. Nevertheless, the two men had something in common – interest in inventions and scientific curiosity. Together, they made a plan to build and distribute a series of teleportation booths in strategic locations around London. Based on ancient Egyptian knowledge obtained from the papyri scrolls in the Valley of the Kings, Warner and Joseph Bonomi the Younger constructed a teleportation system plan that had each booth in a graveyard. It was a clever plan because a cemetery was a convenient place to build unusual structures. A graveyard was a good place to build something out of the ordinary while being undisturbed by observers. In a graveyard, highly eccentric structures could be explained away as the strange last wishes of the dead. A cemetery is a perfect place if you want to hide a secret. Much of this ambitious project was financed by a rich woman known as Hannah Courtois. She gave the two men money to build seven ancient Egyptian technology teleportation devices in key graveyard locations throughout London. In his book, True Time Travel Stories, Amazing Real-Life Stories in the News, Richard Bullivant writes that researchers speculate that in exchange for her financial patronage, Samuel and Joseph promised to build a special kind of tomb for Hannah Courtois and her three daughters, a tomb that would allow them to cheat death by transporting them to another location in time. Unfortunately, Hannah died four years before the time portal tomb designed for her was built and erected in Brompton Cemetery, London. Her body was supposedly moved from its original place of burial to the tomb in 1852. There is reason to believe that Hannah Courtois and her two daughters are not resting in their elaborate Egyptian tomb in Brompton Cemetery. Apparently, some believe the Cordoy tomb is not a tomb at all, but one of the teleportation devices that Samuel Warner and Joseph Bonomi the Younger set up in London cemeteries. Boulevant writes that no records have ever been found for the tomb which supposedly houses the bodies of the Cordoy women. On paper, the tomb does not exist. Without paperwork, some historians say it would have been simply impossible to place a tomb in that location. Many today believe the Cordois tomb sits empty and that the three Cordois women are not buried there and, in fact, is not a tomb at all, but rather a gateway to travel elsewhere in time. In 1853, Samuel Warner died under mysterious circumstances and he was supposedly buried in Brompton Cemetery. However, some records show no corpse was ever recovered, and Samuel's grave is unmarked. His death seems to be shrouded in mystery, and so does his final resting place. Many people are still asking if a time travel machine is hidden in the granite mausoleum in Brompton Cemetery in West London. The truth is that no one really knows, and the mystery won't be solved until a new key is inserted in the lock and the heavy bronze door swings open to reveal the tomb's secrets. When I was a teenager, some friends and I went to an old abandoned house and took a Ouija board with us. We all went upstairs to the attic sat on the floor in a circle, and turned off all the lights. Now, there was nothing inside this house except the six of us, four girls and two guys. I started asking the board questions, but it wasn't working. A couple of us girls wondered if some of us were moving the planchette on purpose, but everybody insisted they weren't. A bad thunderstorm suddenly came up, and the lightning was really bad. There was even a scary old tree right next to the window, just like in horror movies. 
And then someone asked the ghost or whatever to show itself. All of a sudden, we heard what sounded like something really heavy hitting the floor. Everybody screamed and jumped up and ran toward the light switch. When we turned on the light, there was nothing on the floor. We left right after that, and we never went back. I don't know about my friends, but I never touched a Ouija board after that. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard about during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories, authors, and sources I used in the episode notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey Weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel, and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.